Hey guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering culture and communication within the mental health setting. Guys, if you haven't done so already, please do not forget to like and subscribe below. Don't forget to check out my other social media platforms. The handle still the same, Nexus Nursing, across all platforms. So before we get started, guys, let's pray to God to help you get through this video. All right, Father God, thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. Thank you for watching over us. Thank you for your protection. Thank you for your favor and mercy over for every single viewer. Lord, I ask that you please help each viewer that's watching this video, Lord, help them to understand this information, help them to retain this information, and help them to process this information accordingly. Thank you for this viewer's life. Thank you for their health. Thank you for the intelligence that you've placed in their bodies, Father God. And I ask that you help them to be successful on their exam. Thank you for all you've done, all you continue to do. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Okay, guys, let's get started. First question. When the nurse focuses on the client's specific behavior rather than on the client himself or herself, the nurse is using a strategy of non-threatening feedback. Which nursing statement is an example of the strategy? One, it's okay to be angry, but throwing the book was unacceptable behavior. Two, you can't always believe you're always, I can't always believe you're always as manipulative. Three, you're an irresponsible person regarding your life choices. Or four, asking for meds every two hours proves you are drug seeking. And guys, the correct answer is one, it's okay to be angry, but throwing the book was unacceptable behavior. So you're acknowledging that patient's feelings of being angry and you're letting that patient know it's okay to be angry, but the behavior following that emotion was unacceptable. Why? Because it's unsafe. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. Look at two. I... First of all, you start with I. In nursing, do we ever make things about ourselves? No, it's always about the patient, but let's keep going. It says, I can't believe you are always this manipulative. There's so many things wrong with that statement. Number one, you started with yourself. It's not about you, it's about the patient. Number two, you're saying, I can't believe you're always, so you're accusing that patient and we're using um, all inclusives. Do we use always, only, never? No, we stay away from those, right? And the third thing that's wrong, you're calling the patient manipulative. That's not therapeutic, so that's wrong. Choice number three, you are an irresponsible person. You're calling that person irresponsible. Is that therapeutic? Absolutely not. Four, asking for meds every uh, two hours proves you. So you're focusing, focusing on that patient and what you're fo focusing about that patient is something negative. That's not therapeutic. But number one, where you acknowledge that patient's feelings, but then you focus, focus on the actions and not that patient itself, that's the correct answer. That's the therapeutic answer. That's why number one is the correct answer, guys. You want to focus on the behavior and not the patient because when you focus on the patient regarding something negative, they're going to feel attacked, okay? They're not going to want to open up. Next question. The nurse understands that one of the many strategies of non-threatening feedback is to limit the feedback to an appropriate time and place. While in the milieu, which nursing statement is an example of this strategy? One, let's talk about your marital concerns in the conference room after visiting hours. Two, I know your mother's visiting you, but I need answers to these questions. Three, why don't we talk about your childhood sexual abuse? Or four, let's talk about your grievance with your doctor during group. And guys, the correct answer is one. Let's talk about your marital concerns in the conference room. So we're going somewhere we can have privacy after visiting hours. So it's not something that you're trying to discuss with the patient while they're visiting with family members. You think that patient's going to want to focus on talking about their problems when they have a chance to visit with family or friends? So that's the correct answer. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices too. I know your mother's visiting you, but I need answers to these questions. You wanna know what you say to the patient when you say that? You say that what you need from that patient is more important than that visit with the mother. False. Three, why? Let's stop right there. Do we ever ask a patient why or what made you? No. The minute you do that, you put them on the defense where they feel like they have to either explain themselves or you're giving them a way out. That's number one. And number two, let's keep going. Why don't we talk about your childhood sexual abuse? 
Childhood sexual abuse is something that's very traumatizing and anything that is heavy or traumatizing, you just don't dive right in. That patient's not going to want to talk to you, right? You ease that conversation. So you have to start with very light things and then you get into that. That patient's not going to want to just off the bat want to talk about their most traumatic experience. So that's false. And then you have four. Let's talk about your grievance with your doctor during group. Do you think that patient's going to want to talk about their personal health concerns or their problems with the physician in front of other people? Absolutely not. That's something that they'll need to speak to you about privately. So number one is the correct answer. Which nurse client communication centered skill implies correctness? One, the nurse communicates regard for the client as a person of worth who's valued and accepted without qualification. Two, the nurse communicates an understanding of the client's world from the client's internal frame of reference with sensitivity to the, to the client's current feelings and the ability to communicate this understanding in a language attuned to the client. Three, the nurse communicates that the nurse is an open person who is self-congruent, authentic, and transparent. Or choice four, the nurse communicates specific terminology rather than abstractions in the discussion of the client's feelings, experiences, and behaviors. And guys, the correct answer is four. The nurse communicates specific terminology rather than abstractions in the discussion of the client's feelings, experiences, and behaviors. So guys, um, when you do that, you're not leaving any room for there to be... Um, incorrect assumptions or misstatements you're being very specific you're being very detailed you're being very precise okay and that is correctness now let's look at the wrong answer choices let's look at one the nurse communicates regard for the client as a person whose worth is valued and accepted without qualification so when you're showing that patient that you value them and they don't have to prove themselves in order to get that value or worth. That's what the qualification is. What's that? That's showing respect. That's showing respect. They don't have to prove themselves in order to, to have value or worth that's given to them. Okay. Choice two, the nurse communicates an understanding of the client's world from the client's internal frame of reference with sensitivity to the client's feelings and the ability to communicate this understanding in a language that is attuned to the client. Guys, that is empathetic understanding. So that is where you can see where that patient's coming from, what they're explaining to you, and you can communicate with them, letting them know you understand where they're coming from. Okay, how they're viewing things from their position in life. Okay, so that's empathetic understanding. Choice three, the nurse communicates that the nurse is an open person who's self-congruent, authentic, and transparent. And that's genuineness. That's when you're showing that you are a genuine person. In other words, you're not fake. Okay, so the correct answer, guys, is number four. To understand and participate in therapeutic communication, the nurse must understand which of the following select all that apply. Guys, how do we treat select all that apply as true or false? Let's go. One, more than half of all messages communicated are nonverbal. True. And guys, nonverbal communication is much more valuable to you than verbal communication. If a patient says, yes, I'm happy, but they're looking like this. Yes, I'm happy. Does that patient really look happy? No. And so there are things that patients or people may not want to speak about. They might be anxious about, they might be angry about, and they're not ready to disclose that verbally, but their body language, their facial expression will tell you. Okay. So that's true. Two, all communication is best accomplished in a social space context. False. All guys, what did I tell you about all inclusives? All, always, never, only. Do not choose them unless you know that you know that you know that's the answer. And guess what? That's not the answer. That is false. All communication is best accomplished in a social space context? Absolutely not. Because a lot of communication is most effective what? In a one-on-one -on -one, uh, setting, professional setting. So that's false. Three, touch is always po a positive form of communication to convey warmth and caring. False. Why? That word always, that is an all-inclusive. Look what it says. It says touch is always a positive form of communication. 
No, it's not. Because if that person doesn't want to be touched and they told you they don't want to be touched and you touch them, are you showing caring? No, you're showing that you're disrespecting their, their, their feelings and their wishes. So that's false. Four, the physical space between two individuals has great meaning in the communication process. True. When a patient's talking about their deepest, darkest feelings and your arms are not crossed, your arms are open, and you're very close to that patient, you're even leaning into that patient, what does that say to the patient? It says that you're there. You're listening actively to them, right? But if you're standing far away, that patient's on the bed talking to you, and you're over here by the door. You, you got half your body, matter of fact, is outside of the door. Are you, are you communicating to that patient that you're trying to hear what they're trying to say? No, you're communicating to that patient that I'm ready to get out of here, hurry up, finish talking. Okay, so that's true. The physical space between two individuals has great meaning in communication. Absolutely. Um, choice five, the use of silence is the use of silence never varies across cultures. That's false. Look at that. That's another all inclusive. Never. The use of silence never varies across cultures. Absolutely, because in one culture, silence may be respect, where in another culture, silence may mean disrespect. So absolutely, it uh, varies. So for this question, only number one and number four are true. If you notice, number two has an all-inclusive all. Number three has an all-inclusive always. And number five has an all-inclusive never. A nurse is communicating with the client in an inpatient psychiatric unit. The client moves closer and invades the nurse's personal space, making the nurse uncomfortable. Which is an appropriate nursing intervention? One, the nurse must ignore this behavior because it shows the client's progressing. Two, the nurse expresses a sense of discomfort and limits behaviors. Three, the nurse understands the client requires various amounts of personal space and accepts the behavior. Or four, the nurse confronts and informs the client that the client will be secluded if this behavior continues. And guys, the correct answer is three. The nurse expresses a sense of discomfort. You verbally, you let them know that they're making you uncomfortable and limit behavior. How do you limit behavior? You tell them to back up. Yeah. OK, this is an opportunity for you to teach that patient appropriate boundaries. OK, now let's look at the wrong answer choice. One, the nurse ignore. You never ignore bad behavior. OK, you have an opportunity to correct and to teach the patient. You don't ignore it. Choice number three, the nurse expresses uh, excuse me, nurse number three, the nurse understands the client requires various amounts of personal space and accepts the behavior. No. Because if that patient is making you, the nurse, uncomfortable, how do you think they're making everyone else on the unit uncomfortable? They have to know that there are personal boundaries that must be respected. And you're going to teach that to the patient. This is a teaching opportunity. Choice four, the nurse confronts. Stop right there. You don't confront a, nurse, uh, a patient. You don't exacerbate a, a situation. You can teach that patient without being confrontational and exacerbating the situation. So guys, the correct answer is number two. You express to the patient that you're invading my personal space. You're making me feel comfortable and I need you to back up two or three feet. Okay. A client on a psych unit is telling the nurse about losing an only child in a plane crash and about the anger towards airline, the airline. In which situation is the nurse demonstrating active listening? One, agreeing with the client. Two, repeating everything the client says to clarify. Three, assuming a relaxed posture and leaning towards the client. Or four, expressing sorrow and sadness regarding the client's loss. And guys, when you want to show active listening, the correct answer is three, assuming a relaxed and posture and leaning towards the client. So your body's relaxed. You're letting that patient know, I'm here to listen to you. I don't have anywhere to go, right? And you're leaning in. You're letting that patient know that I'm listening to what you have to say. Now, let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, agreeing with the client. You're never supposed to agree or disagree because when you agree or disagree with the patient, you're letting them know that you have a right to judge one way or another. So that's false. Choice two, repeating everything. 
Isn't that an all-inclusive, guys? Agreeing with everything the client says to clarify? No, if you keep repeating everything a client says, all you're doing is what? Parroting. That's called parroting, and that is not a form of therapeutic communication. Now, once in a while, you can repeat what a patient says in order to clarify, but if you repeat everything, all you're doing is parroting. Choice number four, expressing sorrow and sadness regarding the client's life. Guys, it's about the patient, not you. So the client's telling you what's going on and you start crying, you just made it about you. Okay, there's a big difference between sympathy and empathy. Sympathy is where you can understand where that patient's coming from. You can put yourself in their shoes and still be able to be therapeutic to that patient, okay? That is empathy. Sympathy is where you put yourself in that patient's shoes and you just fall apart. Okay, you want to be empathetic, not sympathetic. Big difference. So guys, the correct answer is going to be number three. Um, I love watching ID Network. I love watching shows like um, Forensic Files and um, um, just crime. I love watching those types of shows. And so if you watch those type of shows, you'll notice when the police are doing their interrogations, the cop that's always playing the good cop what does he do? He moves his chair right next to the suspect, right? He's not sitting across from the suspect. He moves his chair right next to the suspect and he leans in and asks the question. Just the fact that the police officer moved the chair closer to him and leaned in, it gives the suspect the feeling of this person's on my side. This person cares what I have to say. Okay, so guys, just leaning in and being closer, that proximity to the client, it gives them a feeling of this person really cares of what I have to say. And it opens up the doors for the patient to communicate their thoughts or their feelings. So guys, number three is the correct answer, assuming a relaxed posture and leaning towards the client. Culture specific syndromes occur in individuals who are especially vulnerable to stressful life events. Which culture specific syndrome would be reflective of the term falling out? One, with symptoms of terror, nightmares, delirium, anxiety, and confusion, this illness is believed to be induced by witches. Two, with symptoms of sudden collapse, a person cannot see even though his or her eyes are wide open. Three, with hexing, witchcraft, and the evil influences of another person, illness and even death may result. Or four, with a fixed stare by an adult, a child or another adult may become ill. And the correct answer, guys, because remember we're talking about falling out, is choice two. With symptoms of sudden collapse, a person cannot see even though his or her eyes are wide open. This is a dissociative phenomenon and we see this often in um, people from like um, the Caribbean, the Caribbean islands. And this falling out, I wanna give you an example. So this is a first time father, um, his wife is giving birth and he's seeing the baby for the, for the first time. And, you know, it's like he passed out. Looks like he passed out. His eyes are open, but he can't see, right? That's falling out. And it's just a dissociative um, phenomenon. It, the patient recovers quickly. We see this very often, people from the Caribbean or Southern states such as Florida, okay? Now, let's look at the wrong answer choices. We have one, symptoms of terror, nightmares, delirium, anxiety, and confusion. This illness is believed to be induced by witches. Um... This is more in the culture of the Native Americans, and it's called ghost sickness, okay? Choice three, with hexing, witchcraft, and evil influences of another person, illness and even death may result. This is what's known as voodoo, and we see this a lot in the Caribbean cultures and um, Latin American cultures. Um, number four, with a fixed stare by an adult, a child or another adult may become ill. This is what's known as the evil eye. And we see this more in the med Mediterranean cultures and the Latin American cultures. Next question. A Native American comes to the emergency department with signs and symptoms of double pneumonia. 
The client states, I will not agree to hospital admission unless my shaman is allowed to, con allowed to continue helping me. Did I pronounce that right? Shaman or shaman? Someone tell me in the, the comments. I think it's shaman, but please excuse me if I'm mispronouncing it pronouncing that, which would be an appropriate way for the nurse to handle the situation. One, tell the client that the shaman is not allowed in the emergency department Two, contact the shaman and have the shaman meet the attending physician in the emergency department. Three, have the shaman talk to the client in admission into admission without the shaman or four, explain to the client that the shaman is responsible for the client's condition. I'll give you a hint. It's not four. Okay, guys, the correct answer is two. Contact the shaman and have them meet the attending physician in the emergency department. So, guys, the U.S. Indian um, Health Service has worked very closely with the U.S. American um, healers and healthcare providers for decades and decades and decades. This patient who is gravely ill, they've got pneumonia in both lungs, saying that they will not be, you know, admitted to the hospital without their spiritual, you know, healer. So guess what? The physician is going to work with them. You're not going to ban them from coming into the hospital or tell them that they're the reason that they're sick. Absolutely not, guys. The whole point is, um, therapeutic care to get that patient better so the correct answer guys is going to be number two all of the other choices are incorrect on an inpatient psychiatric unit an asian american client states i must have warm ginger root for my migraine headache the nurse understanding the effects of cultural influences attaches which meaning to the statement one the client's being obstinate and wants control over his or her care Two, the client believes that ginger root has magical qualities. Three, the client believes that health restoration involves the balance of yin and yang. Or four, Asian Americans refuse to take traditional medication for pain. Okay, guys, the correct answer is the client believes that health restoration involves the balance of yin and yang. So, guys, that yin, yin and yang, yin and yang, it represents opposites, like hot, cold, hard, soft. Okay. So the reason that this patient, um, wants the warm, warm, what, let me go back to question. Okay. Excuse me. The warm ginger root, they believe that warm ginger root is going to, um, push out that headache, which is most likely cold. So they believe in us uh, in the opposite. So number three is the correct answer. One, two, and four are absolutely false. Culture-specific syndromes occur in individuals who are especially vulnerable to stressful life events. Which culture-specific syndrome would be reflective of the term voodoo? You guys all should get this right. One, with symptoms of terror, nightmares, delirium, anxiety, and confusion, witches are believed to induce this illness. Two, with symptoms of sudden collapse, a person can't see even though their eyes are wide open. Three, with hexing, witchcraft, and evil influences of another person, illness, and even death may, may result. Or four, with a fixed stare by an adult, a child or another adult may become ill. And guys, the correct answer is three. With hexing, witchcraft, evil influences of another person, illness, and even death may result. That is voodoo. And again, guys, we see this more in... Um, patients that are from the Caribbean or Latin American cultures, or in the U.S., we see this uh, primarily like in those Southern states, such as, you know, the Floridas and the Georgias, those Southern states. Um, number one, we see this more with the Nat Native Americans. Number two, we see this more with patients in the Southern U.S. and the Caribbean. And then choice number four, again, we see this more with the patients from the Mediterranean or Latin America. Next question. A kosher diet is to the Jewish client as a halal diet is to the one Mormon, two Muslim, three Asian Pacific Island, or four Native American client. And guys, the correct answer is two Muslim client. So kosher guys, that's a food that is clean or permissible for that cu culture. 
okay? So a kosher diet is to the Jewish um, um, uh, culture as halal is to the Muslim culture. Now, I want to talk to you a couple things. Let's go through this list. So number one, Mormon, that's the church of Jesus Christ of La um, Latter-day Saints. They will not, according to their culture, ingest anything with caffeine. So no coffee, no tea, and also no alcohol. They won't drink alcohol. Um, the Muslim, Muslim clients, they will only eat meat that's been slayed or slaughtered, I should say, by their traditions, okay? Um, three, Asian Pacific Island. Their main staple is like rice, fish, veggies. Native American client, their main staples is meat and corn, okay? That's like their preferred food. But when it comes to the Muslims, like I said, their meat has to be slaughtered by their... Um, by their traditions, which guys, to be honest, I, I'm not sure exactly what that tradition is, but I know they have, um, I don't even want to say a, a, a healer because I don't know what the Muslim uh, pastors, I'm using the wrong word, but their, um, their spiritual person that, that has something to do with that process. But the point is the meat that they eat, it has to be halal or they will not eat it. Um, something else, kosher where it says kosher diet to Jewish. So something you have to know about the Jewish culture, they will not eat pork. Muslims don't eat pork also, by the way. Um, Jewish culture, they will not eat pork or shellfish such as lobster, shrimp, okay? So that's important to know. Next question. A healthcare team, an Asian American client, and several members of the client's family are meeting together to discuss the client's imminent discharge. During this time, the client does not speak and make eye contact only with family members. From a cultural perspective, which nursing assessment accurately describes the client's behavior? One, the client has a lack of understanding of the disease process. Two, clients experiencing denial related to the client's condition. Three, the client's experiencing paranoid thoughts towards authority figures. Or four, the client has respect for members of the healthcare team. And guys, the correct answer is four. The client has respect for members of the healthcare team. Go back to the question, what kind of client are we dealing with in Asian American? So them... Um, showing deference, showing respect is, you know, avoiding eye contact, using silence. For them, that's a way of showing respect. And so they're showing respect to those who are in a position of authority, such as the nurses or the doctors. Okay. Next question. A bouquet of roses delivered to a psych unit for a young Vietnamese American woman who's been admitted with a general anxiety disorder. When presented with the roses, the startled client bursts into tears. What understanding does the nurse have regarding the Vietnamese culture that would explain this response? One, the client's overwhelmed by the sender's thoughtfulness. Two, the client's allergic to roses. Three, the client dislikes any flowers that have thorns. Or four, the client feels that flowers are only for the dead. And the correct answer is four. The client feels that flowers are only for the dead. So in American culture, guys, when we want to celebrate someone or show them that we care, we want to be thoughtful, we send flowers. But go back to the question. She's a Vietnamese American. And in the Vietnamese culture, flowers are reserved for burial rites or rites of the dead. So that's why she freaked out when she saw the when she saw the flowers because in her culture those flowers are reserved for dead rights of the dead okay next question a religious jewish client on a psychiatric unit pushes a tray away without eating any of the ham rice and vegetable entree which information about jewish culture would the nurse attribute to this behavior one the client's allergic to rice two the client's a vegetarian Three, the client follows religious dietary laws. Or four, excuse me, the client follows the dietary laws of Islam. And guys, the correct answer is three. The client follows religious dietary laws. Go back to the question. This patient is, look what it says, a religious Jewish person. And we know that they do not eat what? Pork, swine, ham, 
So that's why they pushed that plate away because there was pork, there was ham on that plate. So that's why uh, number three is the correct answer. All right, guys, we are down to our last question. An Orthodox Jewish client is upset. The client's son has recently committed suicide. The client tearfully tells the nurse that the son has disgraced the family and cannot be buried with honors. Which intervention should the nurse implement? One, ask the client why the son won't be buried with honors. Two, accept that the client is upset and just needs time alone. Three, call the psychiatrist for anti-anxiety medication. Or four, sit with the client and allow expression of loss and sorrow. And the correct answer is four, sit with the client and allow expression of loss and sorrow. When you sit there and you're quiet, you're just sitting there, you're offering self. You're letting that client know that you're important to me. And even though I have other patients to take care of, you are important to me. So I'm going to sit here and I'm ready to talk when you are. That's offering self. So that's the correct answer. Look at number one, ask the client why. Didn't I just tell you we don't ask the client why or what made you? So you know that's not the answer. Two, accept the client is upset and just needs time alone. This client is crying and they're expressing themselves and you're going to walk out the room? How is that therapeutic? Remember, therapeutic communication is anything that you do that opens the door for the patient to express themselves, not close off communication. So that's wrong. Choice three, call the psychiatrist for anti-anxiety medication. No. Remember, guys, we go from least invasive to most invasive. So what do we want to do? We want to allow that patient to express their feelings. We're going to offer self. We're going to do choice number four. Guys, I hope you found this video to be helpful. If you want to see more of the subject matter, be sure to leave a comment for me below. If you want to see something else, make sure you let me know in the comments. Don't forget to check out my website, Nexus Nursing Institute, where I have plenty of resources, audio lessons available for you guys. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this video. Subscribe to the channel. And guys, please don't forget to share my content. That is how we get this channel to grow so I can have more time to spend to make more videos for you. Let me know what you thought about this video. you see me next week on the next video.